Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Fort, uh, this time with Herbert Deese, the CEO of Volkswagen Group. And uh, I've never done uh, a shot quite like this before. You're not in an office. You're in a bus, in a Volkswagen uh, bus in Texas. Uh, I normally start asking what, what today's toughest problem is, but you also got to tell me about the bus. I probably start with the bus and then we go to the problem. Yeah, I'm uh, actually, uh, it's a very exciting day for me because we are presenting the electric bus, the Volkswagen bus uh, car, which is, I think, uh, really uh, America did wait for this car. It was time to bring it. Uh, it's going to be launched first in Germany uh, later this year. Uh, the first press reaction is just fantastic. People around us are taking photos. And I'm really excited because uh, already before I joined Volkswagen, I wanted to do this car, you know, an all electric uh, Volkswagen microbus. And I think it came out quite nicely. So I'm very happy. On the other hand, uh, we have this uh, terrible war situation in Europe, very close to us, uh, which is a big concern pictures are getting worse by the day and this is by far my biggest concern now, it's a human tragedy but it's also uh, it's, it's high risk for world economy for germany uh, so i think it's it's really the most serious issue we have had since years uh, and let's I, I do want to talk about the bus but as, as you mentioned um what's happening in europe uh, in Ukraine specifically, a human tragedy, very important to the overall economy. So we're, we're gonna we're gonna handle a bunch of things. L let's start there because this week I've been asking CEOs, I've been asking analysts about the overall impact of that ongoing conflict on the European economy, um, not not just on sentiment, but then also uh, the price spikes. Right. And then the impact on uh, consumer spending, therefore, I believe you said that it's possible that the impact of this conflict could be more serious than COVID has been. Uh, can, can you elaborate on that? Uh, I have to say, you know, I'm uh, actually it's it, it doesn't feel like that. But if you if you imagine what could it be you now if if this uh, war would last for weeks ongoing, even months, uh, and the disturbances for the uh, European economy, they would be huge. Germany would be hit hard. Uh, we have supplies from the Ukraine. Uh, we have uh, probably millions of refugees uh, uh, to deal with. And an ongoing conflict would probably lead to a further escalation, you no know, stepping up escalations between the uh, and the rest of the world, so the scenario could be very bleak and it's very concerning. Uh, uh, and, and, and the tragedy, the human tragedy would, would go on and go on. So this is something which really could hurt us. And you're absolutely right now. I think first you look at, at the how important is Russia no? as a business partner for, for European economies. And you, you come to the conclusion, OK, it's probably not so hard because the economy is not so big. But then you have those secondary effects. Energy supply for Germany, for uh, Europe is uh, tremendously important uh, from uh, Russia. And then you have this uh, price spiral coming up, inflation creeping up. So probably government would have to step in for for, for bailing out uh, some of the operations. So this is a very bleak scenario for me. No. Uh, does it come necessarily? No, but I think we, we really we should do everything that we get this conflict from halt, get back to negotiation, and try to solve it. How how humans should solve conflicts? Talking to each other. And I, I know you got a bit of background uh, noise there. It's a, it's a little bit of the the um, the price we have to pay for you being actually inside the product. So uh, I, I do want folks to be aware of that. That's the background noise because you're actually there inside the, the new Volkswagen minibus um, in, in Texas. But now uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time here, but I want to give it its due. In what ways are you, uh, as an executive at a very important company in Europe, 
keeping in touch with other executives? What signals are you watching for how this is going to affect uh, operations going forward? And I, I think we've got to assume at least the possibility that this does continue for weeks. Yeah, we have high exposure to Russia. We have about 7,000 people working for Volkswagen. They are two plants, uh, many customers, and we ceased our operations, basically. Now we shut down operations already a couple of days ago. Uh, we're still paying our, our salaries. No, the people receive their money. We're still supplying spare parts for our customers no, because they, they, they have to move. Uh, but we, we uh, fully support the sanctions we have because only only I think with a strong reaction from the West, we can bring Putin back to negotiations and uh, and try to solve the conflict. So that is basically doing, and we are contributing to give some release to the humanitarian tragedy. You know, we are helping with the refugees. We are uh, even uh, just we, we, we preparing two uh, big trucks uh, supplying the Red Cross and we are, we are many of our plants, many of our people are helping sending uh, some of my first line of flying next week to Poland to try to help. Uh, so uh, humanitarian help is, is, is something we definitely we, 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 we are contributing to. Uh, and needed, I'm sure. Uh, now, um, D difficult uh, transition, but we'll, we'll talk about both the, the big picture uh, macro and, and geopolitical issues as well as uh, Volkswagen itself and your various brands and how you're navigating this. Um, as we see spiking gas prices and then overall as we see the move in the industry toward electric, uh, how does that fit into uh, the set of product challenges that you find yourself solving? I think we are well set because you know we are we have been starting thinking this uh, electric uh, transition already six seven years ago. We're coming with a huge range of products. Just uh, behind of us, there's an ID4 park, which is a very successful Volkswagen model in the United States. We have uh, we are the second most important EV manufacturer, uh, let's say, a provider here in the United States, which is. Uh, Will become a very important market for us EVs. The whole world is now committing to EVs, China, Europe, the US, and we feel strong there. Now we have, uh, I think we have very authentic product like this uh, bus could be, very modern product. Uh, and uh, we become, I think we're coming with the right product at the right time. We're a market leader in Europe now, um, ahead of some uh, of, of one of our American competitors, and we are gaining strong momentum in China. Uh, and we are getting in, let's say, the cars becoming really nice and connected. Uh, so um, we feel we feel strong for this transition uh, period. It, it has surprised some people over time how friendly you've been with Elon Musk. Speaking of uh, American uh, competitors <laughs> in EVs, uh, there's a report from a while back that that he tried to recruit you uh, to go, um, you know, lead uh, Tesla. You chose Volkswagen. Explain to me from a global and competitive perspective uh, how you, as leading Volkswagen, look at Tesla, both its its impact on the industry overall, and then, you know, as a competitor who you're trying to go to head-to-head -to -head with and beat. Uh, first of all, I think, you know, our roles are totally different. No, Tesla is a pioneer the industry, challenging the industry, starting with a white sheet of paper. No, no, not taking into account all the experience the industry, all the learnings the industry had for years, all the heuristics we are applying. So, and this is makes a totally different business case to, let's say, kind of my duties, which is transforming a company, a very, very big company, you know, with certain brands, Porsche, Audi, Volkswagen, uh, very internationally already geared up, set up with uh, relatively good business. And we will later come to our, our business figures in the uh, conventional car segment, not in the ICE segment. So we are really good there and we have strong brands and, and, and good earnings. Uh, but transforming this big machine or organism, you might call it, into this new world of EV only probably in, in only 10, 15 years time, and then fully connected. You know, the cars are really becoming internet devices now, which is which are areas where we have to learn 
learn fast to be competitive with the, uh, with the new entries. And this makes our, let's say, the two tasks totally different. Totally different. Uh, uh, but still, I think we can learn from each other. And uh, it's, I'm really still impressed by the pace Elon is going and, and the speed. Uh, and, uh, and the new approaches, no? Because you can really think new, and it's always, I'm always curious about what, what's, what's next is coming forward with. Uh, on the other hand, no, also, I think my part is uh, probably at least uh, uh, as satisfying, and, and I'm very grateful for it because, you know, we have those kind of iconic products like a microbus could be, you know, and we can reinvent it for the new world. And we have an existing organization which which is performing, uh, so it's. Uh, uh, I, I really I, I think we are we are very complementary. No, let's say it's kind of, of Tesla paving the way, and uh, see uh, you know even even if uh, getting back to our main location which is Wolfsburg. No, we are only 200 kilometers away from uh, Grünheide, which is uh, Elon's uh, newest plant in Europe. So this will be also a fierce competition. We just decided, because you know our plant is very old, we have our plants probably 70, 75 years old by now, and we just decided to build a new plant outside that we can be competitive with the uh, with Elon's team in Grünheide, which I think is also, it's, uh, it's, it's good not to have new competition. Uh, we certainly do believe in competition. I want to I want to spend some time on something that you, you just said about electric only in ten to fifteen years. Um, right now, in every country, there's a network of gas stations, right, stretching across from from here to there. Uh, and right now, also in Europe, you know, the EU discussing energy policy and what needs to be done over the next several years, similar time frame over the next decade, et cetera, to not be as reliant on fossil fuels coming out of Russia. What needs to be done in terms of both infrastructure and energy policy for that idea of the EV, total EV transition in 10 to 15 years to be realistic? Yeah, yeah. Probably 10 to 15 years is too optimistic for the world. No, but there will be regions where this is going to happen. If you look in the northern regions of Europe, regions for sure it's going to happen. Uh, and it, it's, it's depending a lot on the primary energy production. So I think it, uh, EVs only make sense if you have primary energy from sun and wind. You know? It has to be renewable or nuclear, no? but sun and wind uh, predominantly. So the first thing uh, to happen is this transition of the energy sector into renewables. We have some countries in Europe which are quite advanced. No? We already have 60, 70 percent. We have very low uh, carbon content in the kilowatt hour, no? uh, where it, uh, EVs are a must already. You know, Norway, for instance, Sweden, uh, France with uh, this nuclear power. Uh, but this has to come first. And then networks, uh, my feeling is that the networks are growing really fast. We have been contributing here in the United States for in Electrify America, which is a fast charging network covering the whole country from West Coast to East Coast. It's working well. It's uh, already used by many customers. They're happy with it. Uh, this is happening all over the world. I, I have been using an EV in Europe uh, for about 15,000 kilometers uh, in the last year. And I have to say, I, I only had to queue once in a fast charging station. Yeah? And I, I've never mm. have been lost somewhere. So it's going fast. Uh, so it's first renewable energy networks and cars. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not going overnight, but if you're talking 10, 15 years, this is two life cycles. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, and you will always see some bottleneck somewhere, no? but overall, I think it can be a smooth process. The biggest bottleneck for sure will be battery supply, raw materials mm. for batteries, battery manufacturing, cell manufacturing most. This is probably the biggest constraint to not, not get even faster than those 10, 15 minutes. And, and what to do about that, um, given you know rare earth metals, a lot of those raw materials uh, are part of what we're talking about uh, in this Russia-Ukraine war and conflict. It's not so much about rare earths, no, which is for, for magnets. Uh, you would find those also in other places than, than Russia. 
uh, lithium is something which has nothing to do with Russia. Uh, nickel might be, you know, uh, Russia has big nickel uh, production. The raw materials are basically there, but we need more exploration, we need more equipment coming in, more mining, just to ramp the capacities. Because the amount of raw materials, the raw materials we are using are not scarce, so probably cobalt being the most critical one, which is kind of a ramp down. So the raw materials are there, but we need the mining capacities, the pre-treatment capacities, and then the battery cell plants, and all require a huge amount of investments. We are only investing 20 billion until 2030 to build six battery plants in Europe. So this is a big uh, endeavor. Yeah, uh, just infrastructure playing out in so many ways. Now, uh, we, we've talked about the, the current state of the business and the current state of play. I also want to spend some time uh, getting to know you personally. I like to start at the very beginning. Um, so tell me, uh, where were you born? Uh, tell me about parents, household, siblings. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm born in Munich. Uh, I'm uh, back in, in, in 58. Um, my family came from Austria. They, I wouldn't call them refugees, but after the after the Second World War, Austria developed very slowly. Whereas in Germany, there there was a place to work and to earn some money, so they came to Germany. I was born in Munich, then educated, went to school, college. Uh, then I've been spending. I have uh, a wife and three children, uh, all uh, grown up already. Uh, they're spending time with me, which makes me very happy. <laughs> that's 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 always a good sign. Yeah, that's a good sign. And uh, uh, you know, I went. Uh, I was. Uh, I spent my whole life in in auto industry. So from from universities, so auto was always probably still remembering the days where I had such kind of a big matchbox. Uh, um, yeah kind of bag where I had uh, 50 of those model cars in and I was playing. Yeah, I was wondering. <laughs> so as, as a kid, so I'm, did you? I'm really, I'm really cars and, and bikes and motorbikes uh, all my life. Uh, I started then working with Bosch, which is a big uh, German supplier. I spent uh, close to 19 years with BMW. Ended up there as heading R&D, so, so driving cars, uh, designing cars, uh, Modifying, improving cars uh, was always uh, very motivating for me, and I very much enjoyed it. And now, since uh, I think it's seven years now, I'm with Volkswagen, and since three years, I'm uh, overseeing the entire group, which is a tremendous job. Yeah, it's really big, yeah. but it's a, a really a fantastic uh, challenge because you know, it's so so. It's it's a, a fantastic team. Yeah, worldwide team. We are working, uh, we have a fantastic team here in the United States, uh, in China, and Latin America. And we have wonderful brands, uh, Porsche, Audi. Audi, uh, yeah. Those precious uh, super premium brands like Lamborghini, Bentley. And yeah. uh, they're doing so many nice products. And you know, what I, what I most like is that this industry now is changing more than ever and so fast. And this product is becoming so, you know, cars always have been an interesting product, you know, because of designs and performance and so on. But now cars are becoming really probably the most sophisticated, product, you know, with artificial intelligence being in every part of this uh, machine. Uh, the machine becomes able to drive autonomously in the next five to 10 years, probably. And uh, the, the machine becomes uh, entirely. Uh, um, you know, environmentally friendly. No, the, right. the, it's uh, no emissions anymore. Very much reduced noise. Much safer. No, we will reduce uh, fatalities and, and accidents quite a lot. So this is really exciting times now. So tell me, uh, staying way back, closer to fifty-eight for a moment. What was the first <laughs> car, Herbert? What was the, what was the first car you loved? You wouldn't know it here, probably. In, in Europe, it was quite fam famous. The first car I had was a, a Fiat 500, well, which was a very small car, 18 horsepower only. Uh, in Europe, it was quite popular by then. Uh, the first car I liked, I can't say, because there were so many. I, I, I loved the Renault Alpines, Porsches, uh, for sure. British uh, cars, I had uh, 
TR uh, uh, Triumph TR uh, for quite some while. And uh, Volkswagen, I had a Beetle, I had two Beetles, I had a Mini. Uh, so I had many cars over the time, and I have to say, I loved them all because, you know, the, 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 the nice thing is that they are so different, no? And they have been. They have been even more different in the old time days. I had uh, I, I drove some some rallies uh, in the Mille Miglia. The car probably I most love is the uh, um, is the T thirty five the Bugatti you now, which is uh, which is stunning car pre war car, but, uh, and uh, it was already then so balanced with hundred fifty horsepower, very nimble, quick car. Uh, it's probably the car I most admire because it was for 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 the time it was used. It was so advanced. It was probably 15, 20 years ahead of of the rest of the cars you could buy. Wow, and, and it's and still working today. It's still fun to drive. Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, so where where did your uh, love of cars come from? Was there somebody in your life, in your family, who introduced you to to the concept, or no? You know, the late 50s, early 60s, this was the days when, when Germany was was becoming an, an automotive nation as well. No, where cars would, uh, where people would, for the first times probably, go to their holidays, go to down to Italy, to Austria, wherever. And uh, this is this was this experience of new freedom, of independence, no? and, and we would uh, even I still remember my my dad. He was washing the car every every Saturday, you know, in the, uh, at, at our at our lawn, lawn basically. And uh, I helped. So, and then I started very early with uh, my my grandparents. They had a farm, and I, I I could use. I could already drive the tractor, and and already. At, uh, at early ages, I had to work there. So I became very exposed to machines, to noise, to the smell, <laughs> and I loved it. I right. <laughs> Outside of that, maybe even academically, what were you focused on when it came to, to learning and, and academic pursuits? Yeah, I started uh, when, I, when I finished uh, um, school. I started university already focused on cars. Now there was a, a direction that was car design. Then I was specializing more in manufacturing, which I like because uh, manufacturing, I was, uh, I started my career in the early days to become a plant manager because uh, there is, uh, you, you would find a, a very nice combination of, of working. It's, it's technology. It's, it's, machines, but it's also people, no? it's managing people. And I loved it, really. I loved always to work with, with organizations, drive organizations forward, uh, drive teams. Uh, that's what I loved. And then uh, I came into that, let's say, auto industry. First, I did uh, alternators for cars in big, big scale, big volume. And then I was in manufacturing back. I was in purchasing and then in R and D. So I had quite a mixed career. I was exposed to many areas. Also, sales. I was running the, the motorcycle division once, which uh, was also really exciting. I loved this uh, those years. So I'm 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 quite broad. Yeah. I'm, I'm well, why is that? Experience. Is that is that because you were determined to to lead from early on and wanted kind of a wide purview or did somebody um, encourage you to, to do those various things as part of a program? I don't know, actually. It happened somehow. No, I, but you're right. I was right from the beginning. I was interested in working with people yeah? in also trying to lead people uh, to make a team to get something done, something bigger done with more big people with a bigger team so this was motivating this led me basically probably into manufacturing first but then I also I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in tech technology and, in, in the cars. and how did it happen you know there was always uh, opportunities and uh, I was there at the right time and I picked those opportunities challenges if you might say and uh, um, this is how it became. It was not there was no plan behind, no real plan. 
What was the first uh, technology challenge and opportunity that, that you can remember that drew you over to that side? Well, just now a, a, a greenish idea that's coming. Yeah, I feel my chance really looking great. I don't know whether you, I, I probably am not allowed to to move that. No, no. You can I'm do not. whatever you want. You can, no. I mean, <laughs> no if, it's, if it's, I, if it's I physically possible. It <laughs> okay. I can't right. get it out, but it looks, it looks uh, so nice. I, I will show it uh, probably later to you. Uh, biggest challenge I always had, and I was always uh, open for a challenge. No, I, I love the challenge. Uh, I, you know, I still remember when I first took over a plant, I was in my early 30s, and there was a plant, I became a plant manager responsible for about uh, 1,500 people or so, and we went into a terrific crisis then, automotive crisis. We had to release many people from work. This was a dreadful experience uh, at the beginning, but then we recovered fast. We made the best out of this crisis, and we came out very strong. Well, this was uh, uh, 93, probably. Uh, this was a very, uh, no, very intense experience. No, Let's say you had to tell people there's no work anymore. We have to send you home. We have to make a selection, and then do with the rest of the team the best you could to become competitive again and, and run the next wave. So this was a tremendous experience. And uh, then I was when I've spent years in the UK. Uh, there was also a formerly a strong industry which came down and, and lost a lot of competitiveness and. Um, the challenge now with Volkswagen is also tremendous because uh, there's so much change now in, in such a short period of time, 10, 15 years, and the car is changing so fast. Uh, what's your, as a leader, what's your strategy for managing change and managing culture? And at what point in your career did you start to learn and focus in on that point? Because you said from the beginning you were interested in working with teams, right? You were interested in, in manufacturing. Um, when you go through difficult times like that, how you handle delivering difficult news and then how you handle rebuilding from there seems to be so important to, uh, to the approach to leadership that you, that you develop. Difficult question, but I would say, you know, the most important thing is, uh, is honesty. Honestly, you, know, you have to you have to be clear, uh, and you have to communicate. You have to if, if there are difficult things, and go for it directly. You know? Don't go around it. Don't don't phone it. So if it's complicated, let's go straight to, to it. Uh, this is something I learned with the first uh, crisis as I had to manage. Uh, and with good communication, I think if, if people understand the, the, the situation and, and the reason why. People are really lonely. They're following and, and trying to do their best. This is my experience. And I would say, honesty is the most important. Okay. So um, I, I always like to ask about uh, an experience that I call Death Valley, kind of a lowest point. Um, could be in life, could be in career. Uh, because I think there's a lot of learning in how you get through that. Um, you know, years back, I mean, we, we've been talking about Volkswagen and the the leadership point that you have in EVs right now in Europe. There have been some challenges in recent years, you know, the, the emissions scandal, whatnot. Um, I don't know if that factors into kind of a Death Valley experience, but what would you say that has been uh, for you? Hmm. You, you mentioned one of those, no, the, I just, uh, when I was joining Volkswagen, I was 15 and I was probably 53 weeks, and then did happen, no? and, uh, and to experience it, how this organization really, and you know, this is 650,000 people and they, they were not uh, uh, responsible for, for diesel, and, but what kind of a blast this was for the whole organization, how everyone suffered from it, you know, and, to get some ground under your feet, this was really, this was difficult times, and it probably the first three years, and, and this start of the industry already started, for well, the first two years or so, probably in the board, we dealt 50% with these issues, no? compensating customers, legal issues, still being, but it's now, it's uh, main focus is, is, is future, 
this was uh, yeah. this was a hard learning and um, tell me about, uh, I believe that there's usually a, a core belief, right, that, that comes out of experiences like that, that you tend to keep as a tool in your toolbox, right, and continue to use in leadership. So um, can, can you isolate something like that that you took out of how you handled that experience? And we've got some background noise. We'll deal with that. Uh, but... Is there a core belief out of that experience that, that you continue to use in leadership? I would say there are two core beliefs which are important in leadership. You know, one, beginning with business, uh, being honest. You have to think positive. You, know, you have to think uh, way forward uh, to improve uh, situations. Um, I think you should be also demanding with yourself and with your people, because people can do a lot, people can make a little difference if you push yourself and, and push your team. I think you always should protect it from fear, inform them well. So I think there are some leadership principles which you learn over time that you it's a great Um. And I'm, I'm sorry, we are dealing with a little bit of the background noise that comes from the benefit sorry, of having. No, I mean, you're, you're, in, you're in an electric mini bus in Texas. Yeah. That's a, that's a the nice. Is the door is open. The door is open. Uh, oh, open. well, there we go. Um, there we go. <laughs> that explains that you. part of it. Okay, sure. You can show me. I can show you. Uh, I can release it. I'd love to get to see uh, as much as possible the interior of, of so, uh, yeah. that refresh Look at this. of an this iconic is, This is the open door. Uh, this is open door. Now I'm going to show you what we have in front. There is uh, through the screen. There's another micro bus, a bus in front. Is this uh, white and green? Can you see it? I can. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Lovely, <laughs> no? <laughs> um, so let me let me take a pause. Uh, and, and ask you some more about the vehicle itself, since that is a big part of, of the news of the day. When you are bringing something that iconic, right, um, the Volkswagen minibus, into an electric era, uh, for a kid who, who started off interested in design and manufacturing, how do you approach that? We, we saw what happened with the Volkswagen Bug, which did so well 20 plus years ago, uh, going through that transition, but it wasn't a technology transition uh, along with a design transition. How do you approach the combination of those things uh, with something like the minibus? Yeah, that's an interesting question because, you know, uh, already before I joined Volkswagen, I wanted to do this car because, you know, there were, there were so many, the, the microbus is probably one of the most iconic products in our industry. Now, if you go to any airport or to a, a souvenir shop, you, know, you would find always uh, T-shirts with microbuses, uh, surfboard on the top. So, because the microbus is much more of a car than a car. Now, it's it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, yeah, it's it's talking about freedom, about experience, about those 60s, 70s, uh, the last century, about uh, the entire generation, about free. So it's uh, it's it's really a big thing this microbus. And you know, following Volkswagen from the outside, they tried to reinvent this bus a few times. They did studies. You no, know, they made kind of retro things. Uh, they once they did the the, the the Volkswagen Beetle. You still remember? You no, know, and there were studies about the bus. And I've seen I've counted probably six or seven or or something. But they didn't succeed because they couldn't. I don't know. They couldn't get it to a feasibility. And I was always thinking, you know. Uh, even before starting Volkswagen, now, as you get a electric skateboard again, no? a flat battery, the wheels on the corners, the engine, once again, you could do in the back, like in the old days, now you have a chance to get back to the old proportions, yeah? to very small overhangs, a big interior, a huge interior compared to a rel relatively small uh, surface uh, and, and, and outer, uh, outer dimensions. 
uh, though this was, uh, I would say, a historic chance, not really to get to get something back on the road which not only resembles but also delivers on the, on those core values of, uh, of let's say, big space inside, relatively simple and clean design. Look around here. Now this is the dashboard. Uh, nice material. So this is really this was a, a technological opportunity which which my predecessors didn't have. So I joined Volkswagen with already with the idea to do this thing. But then I have to say it took me some time because first we had to do the, the, the product portfolio, ID3, ID4, all the electric range. And, and we tried with the bus, but then there's always a question of feasibility. How many can you do? Now the one time uh, spend on such a car is a billion or even more. So feasibility, and then I had to convince teams. So it took me some time, but I'm really happy and I'm proud that I that we did the job and we made it happen. And this makes me really happy now because it's, it's on the road now. I'm happy with it. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it became like uh, like I wanted it, and uh, I think it will be it should be good success and people will love it because it's it's a modern microbus. It's uh, Fully sustainable, emission-free, quiet, still very roomy inside, agile. It moves very, very fast, so people will love it. That makes me makes me happy. How do you approach marketing something like this? Because the the I think lifestyle and image of it is kind of carefree. You know, you talk about the surfboard on top, going to the beach. Um, electric vehicles are still kind of expensive, right? So in a way. You've got to be um, not a hippie <laughs> to afford one, but have a bit of an internal like uh, wanderer to appreciate it. How do you capture all that? Yeah, first of all, I think it's uh, actually it's not any more uh, much more expensive than uh, than a uh, ICE car, no, because of the uh, running costs are much cheaper, maintenance is cheaper on EVs. So I would say they're on par already. They're probably still a bit more expensive uh, on the purchasing price, but then uh, they pay off uh, very fast. Uh, and then this car, you know, this is not only. Uh, something lifestyle it works no? it's really it has 400 kilometers of range uh, it is fast charging 170 kilowatts it has plenty of space inside this is the small version we are sitting in it's a five seater but there will be other version where you have the seats uh, um, opposite to each other so it's a longer wheelbase and then there will also be a commercial version of it so this is a uh, it's it's really a good car and in addition to that, it's a um, it's a lifestyle icon. Yeah, <laughs> it is indeed. That's nice. and we're, we're we're getting the feel the the open um, you know mini bus feel with the with the doors open, the music uh, going by. You're out there in, in Texas. Um, you know, as it's relevant, I do want to pull in uh, some questions from the audience, specifically on this product and technology. Thomas May is asking, how does Volkswagen want to catch up in battery technology, achievable ranges with competitors? Such as Lucid, Tesla, etc. What's your what's your approach on on battery technology as you embark on this bus and so many other products? Yeah, I think we are competitive. No, uh, let's say range wise, we are competitive. I would say also that, uh, and this is the first generation of EVs we see on the roads now. No, but my learning from the last years is it's not only about range. Fast charging is really crucial. No, even if, if you use one, and if you go, for instance, on a Porsche Taycan, no, which is charging in, uh, in four to five minutes, 100 kilometers, it's uh, just you don't need so much range, which makes the car you know, more affordable. So we will focus a lot on fast charging, but you know, at Volkswagen, our cars have to be accessible. So we are using 400 volt technology, uh, uh, and on the Taycans, on the more expensive cars, we are an 800 volt technology which, which makes faster charging basically all in all we think we are very competitive when it comes down to let's say cost price relationship range uh, uh, quality we are id4 was really um, 
very well tested worldwide in China, here in the United States. It became the safest electric car in China. Uh, people love it in the United States. We have good water books. So we feel competitive, but uh, we, are, we are continuously improving. You know? And batteries especially, uh, there is an upgrade of, of chemistry, of an improvement, probably about 2 to 4% every year to getting the newest uh, chemistry into the battery cells. We have been working out now a new standard cell, how we call it, to drive down cost when we bring down cost. Uh, and so uh, competitiveness uh, into our range, uh, price range. And with scale, we think we can be very competitive. So we are we are basically now uh, in three weeks, in three months time launching the ID4 production here it's in uh, Chattanooga. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, launching uh, which production in in Chattanooga? ID4, which is the uh, uh, SUV, electric SUV, which is uh, which we are producing worldwide in two plants in China. Uh, one plant currently in Germany, a second plant in Germany, one in. Uh, um, in the US, in Chattanooga, starting soon, and uh, economy of scale make us very competitive. And uh, this is why we feel quite confident about our EV future. Uh, and yes, you're right, no, battery size, range are improving. I think we, you know, we're not comparing this kind of a lucid, which is a totally different price. So we, we shouldn't, because we want to address the um, yeah, the, the normal affluent customer, not, not the super. <laughs> uh, to, to get yes, um, <laughs> broad broad uh, appeal and lots of brands broad within appeal. Volkswagen Group uh, yeah. as well. Uh, you've got some results uh, out that I would like to talk about financially as well. T talk to me about. Um, 2021, and now what you're expecting coming into 2022, the the overall uh, volume of deliveries, I believe, you know, in, in 2021 was down, but pricing was your friend, right? Margins were good, and you were able to do some things on on how you managed uh, capital spending that that benefited you. Um, what what did you learn from a very difficult year for the industry, and how has that positioned you for 22 and beyond? Actually, I'm I'm very happy with the results. Uh, 21. It was a very challenging year. We had significant uh, constraints uh, all year through. We couldn't produce the amount of cars we could have sold. So we did. We made the best out of it. And I think the teams did really a great job. Uh, we had uh, uh, we had some. Uh, Tailwind for sure, no, on the, as, as the demand was over the supply, so we could reduce our spendings in sales incentives. Uh, we prioritized our higher margin products, uh, which made sure that uh, the premium brands grew uh, and uh, it made good contributions. Uh, also, globally, we are we have been steering the semiconductor supply in such a way that we could improve profits uh, quite considerably, and the team teams did a great job. No, we, we had many shutdowns in plants, so it was not an easy year, but we could cost, uh, reduce the fixed costs. So the company, I would say, after 21 is in better shape. We still invested a lot in future, in, in uh, future product, in technology. Uh, we bought a big American truck company last year. So we did a lot for, uh, for preparing our future. And uh, still, we had uh, excellent cash flows, and, and really, we did good results, you know, record results, uh, which I think was a good preparation for 22. 22, we were quite optimistic about what could happen in 22, but then this war started in Europe, you know, which, which, which really brings a big dark cloud over. Uh, world and you can't say how it's going to work out. You would be in good shape. Yeah. So so it, it, there still is a chance that if, if people sit down and talk to each other, uh, Putin and the Western world, that we get a fast yeah, stop of, of, of the war activities and then negotiations about how to proceed, then there's still a good opportunity to make it to very clear for the industry us as well because we are very well prepared we have a very solid product portfolio the brands are all positive 
and uh, uh, the world economy could really flourish in 22 if if yeah and that is a big yeah. if um big if. tell me on the on the technology side, um, which has played such an important role, you mentioned the semiconductors and what we saw happen during the pandemic. Uh, you can help me maybe understand this dynamic better. I keep hearing about uh, how various automakers um, didn't have the kind of software capability that they're going to want to have in the, in the future to program to the chips available. They were too locked into the, the chips that they had been using and now are thinking more broadly about uh, more sophistication in software, which will allow more flexibility in the semiconductor and other hardware side. How, how was Volkswagen positioned? Have you changed anything based on uh, the, the challenges that confronted the industry over the past couple of years? Mm -hmm. This is a, a structural change we are going through now, no? because our software capabilities have been relatively scarce in the past, because we have been relying on our first tier suppliers. No? They, would, uh, they would ship to us kind of small computers, engine ECU, uh, Airbag ECU, and we would then, let's say, put those ECUs together and make a car out of it. Uh, and so our capabilities were constrained, but we are building up. No, we are now. I think we are. We have uh, insourced uh, uh, software capabilities. We are working closer relationships, and uh, uh, the entire technology in the car will change. We will have one big software stack, which allows you to, let's say, deploy continuously software in the car, update the car, upgrade the car. So this is a new. Uh, it's a step change in the industry, and we are preparing for that, and we're making good progress. You know, the, for instance, those electric cars uh, are being updated already. You no, know, they get uh, software upgrades every six weeks or so. so. We are in this system, and we are learning. But the semiconductor uh, constraints uh, are have different reasons. You no, know, they have uh, the structural reasons. Uh, they are driven also by COVID, by the COVID crisis. There was uh, much more. Uh, demand and supply and capacity in the industry, and it takes time to build up capacity. The uh, auto industry um, is consuming about 9 or 10 percent of the semiconductor manufacturing worldwide in the different technologies, no? And uh, so, and, and we have constraints, capacity constraints, so the, the demand was growing faster in the past two years than expected. And to build up uh, more capacities takes time, three years, four years time to build plants and, and add capacity. And uh, uh, yeah, we are trying to make the best out of it. At the end, it, there should, should be good chances for the auto industry because, you know, uh, it, in such a car, one missing semiconductor can stop production. And it's probably it would cost you a few dollars, no? Or even, even, even smaller amounts. So uh, the question is, does this small semiconductor go to, into a, I don't know, into a uh, smaller device, no, or, or some, some electric device in the household or so, or does it go in a car? So we have, we have much higher contribution margin in the car. We should be able to pull more semiconductors into cars. And this is what's, what's happening in the industry. And this is why we see some elevation already I would say quarter by quarter in, in 22. This constraints should come down and then we will get additional capacity next year, the year after. And I would say a few years time, there won't be any constraints for semiconductors anymore. And at the same time, also the structure of semiconductors will change. We will have bigger computers in the car, less computers in the car, and bigger software stacks, which will be complex and uh, we are building one of those and, uh, and we would like to own one of those big software stacks. All right. Well, look forward to, to learning more about that. And since, since you mentioned the future, uh, th there's a fun question that came across, uh, which is, is there any chance for a lightning bug, an e-beetle? Um, is, is that something you guys have, have batted around? I've been asked that question, and, and people are still very emotional about the car. And you know, uh, Volkswagen did, I think, two versions of a, a new Beetle. It was quite successful and quite popular here in the United States, also as a convertible. And uh, actually, the 
probability and the and the the, the uh, effort you, you could do such a car on an elect in an electric world is less because you get this this uh, electric skateboard and then you can do different designs on it. You know? But our first priority was uh, the, this kind of uh, reloading the brand with motion was the microbus. Yeah, the microbus was our first priority because it makes good sense with the electric platform, uh, huge space inside, compact uh, outer dimensions. But a, a beetle can be done now if there is. A, we would we would consider. We did some studies of an electric buggy, for instance. We could do. A, there was a, a niche car in the, it was probably 70s or so, which was called The Thing, yeah, which was sold also here in the United States, very small quantities. We did a study of that. So we have we have a few more emotional concepts in uh, in our minds. But uh, first priority was uh, was the microbus. And I think it's, it's uh, we, we said it's the right priority. And now that you've now that you've got this done, I guess the world is your oyster. Now we've got this whole conversation, and we haven't talked about Porsche. We haven't talked really about sports cars. And yeah. uh, you know, I, I'm you know, I was like every kid who uh, loved looking at sports cars. I, I've never owned one, but I find them fascinating, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I find them fascinating, right? Uh, and, and I find also the concept of an electric sports car fascinating because it, it seems like almost there's this this in, in inherent conflict in how we've thought of sports cars and the, the sound of them and, and whatnot and the tinkering involved and then electric. Have you gotten any more clarity on what it's going to take to build up um, a culture of a fleet of uh, great electric sports cars? Yeah, you know, it's probably too early to think about a fleet of great electric sports cars, but sports cars are being electrified as well. And I was, uh, I have to say, I was also not sure whether an electric Porsche would work because as you say now Porsche is so much about very specific design which has a lot to do with the package no engine in the back uh, and, and, and very low front uh, and it has a lot to do with the also acoustic experience no it's a typical noise of a Porsche it's very special this is six cylinder boxer engine but I have to say you know after in last year Porsche sold more Porsche Taycans than Porsche 911s in, this, in the second year of the launch of the first electric Porsche. No? Uh, and that means that people really also, they like this sport interpretation of electric cars and it can work. This was for me a, a clear sign. And uh, then you get in this electric world, you get more freedom for the designers. So you get it, it incredibly, incredibly high performance you know, when it comes to zero to 50 or zero to 100. This is uh, it's just so stunning. You get low center of gravity though uh, sports cars are really working in this electric world. Uh, Porsche is working on some more models and some of the other brands are also working on, on very sporty electric cars. But I also, I would say this is a segment where people still, uh, in probably five, ten years time, would look for some specific noise and, uh, and, and combustion engines. My feeling. <laughs> All right. Uh, J Jason Cannon thinks I should uh, I should get Santa working on a Porsche 911. And I think that's about as likely as it fitting through my chimney. But we can dream, right? It's uh, it's it's early enough in the year. Um, we can we can get yes. dreaming and, and working on that. Um, now now to, to close. Look, people are so interested. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, right? I mean, cars, yeah. they're, they're a practical experience. They're a visual experience. Uh, you yeah. know, lots of fun that we get to do this with you actually sitting inside uh, the mini bus. Um, so as we close, uh, tell me about vision heading into further into 2022. We've talked about the geopolitical uh, difficulties and the questions about how that's going to affect the market. What would you say then is your main strategic you know vision and goal for, for this year no still i think we have to do 
and, and contribute where we can to solve this conflict. This is just, it is the most uh, crucial thing for us. Uh, the rest is fine. Uh, and, uh, we, now we have, uh, we have several areas where we have to work. The biggest challenge, technological challenge ahead of us is autonomous driving. Yeah? And uh, uh, we want to be one of the companies being able to drive cars, to drive our customers around in cars. So this is where probably most of my personal uh, strategic thoughts and, uh, and activities would go in in 22 to make sure that we are uh, within this small group of companies who will be able to drive our customers safely around in our cars. Wow. Uh, well, that is specific, and it's a it's a big vision uh, and a big goal. Um, Herbert Deese, uh CEO of Volkswagen Group, I, I really appreciate you joining me for Fort Knox telling me uh, about the company's latest product, which you're sitting inside, and also about your own uh, personal story. Thank you, John. That's a pleasure.